I think when you say cherish the past, I think you cherish the past, but you don't replicate the past. So it's like, you know, you can go to a museum and see the history of humanity and that's kind of beautiful and see it in the context or you can visit a piece of architecture go see the Vatican or something of that nature or the pyramids and you're you, you're seeing human history but to produce something new today or build something new I don't think we should be imitating or being derivative of history we should be building now just as the pyramids for example were a radical structure 3,000 years ago today if we build a new piece of architecture we should make contemporary radical structures also I, I think the world, I mean, when, first of all, when we talk about design, uh, you know, if we're doing industrial design, we talk about industrial design, then most of our products are, are global products, right? They're produced in China or Taiwan or Italy or wherever they're produced, right? But they, they disseminate around the world and they give us similar experiences. So it's hard to argue about a, a kind of nationalism in design in that regard because most things are, are global. And if you're, if you're a good industrial designer today and you're working with a good company, chances are whatever you're designing will be touched by and used all over the world. I think then when we talk about a kind of uh, a language or vernacular or something coming from a specific place, I think you could see that more in a level of craft or a level of interior space or an architecture because architecture is a, is a form of craft in that regard. It's like one-off projects or interiors are one-off projects. So let's say from the Australian point of view, if we talked about what's, what's Australian design, I don't really see it from an industrial design perspective. I would have to see it, I think, more from an interior and architecture perspective, if that makes sense. And here I see, when I see the architecture here, I think there's a, I mean, first of all, there's a, definitely a, a very nice and beautiful embracement of contemporary entity. You know, it seems like everything that's being built is, is trying to push and be, be relatively new. I don't see this, I don't see a kind of nostalgicism or a revivalism. And yeah, maybe yes and no, I don't know. America's a young country and it tends to, it tends to imitate the past too much and a lot of its architecture and a lot of its space, so. Um, but anyway, yeah, so I, and, and plus I think the boundaries and borders are breaking down so much and I think there's so much information and so much work out there and so many designers. I think that even any Australian designer right now is very influenced by the rest of the world probably more so than they are influenced by their place. And I think that's the majority of us, I think. We're seeing the world in a more global perspective. Listen, I, I don't know. You know, fr frankly, I, I, uh, I think what I always find very perverse about humanity is we've created all of these professions. There's you know, so, so much stuff and everybody doing this and doing that. And I'm sure there'll be, there's always a market for trends, for trend forecasters and all that. I think, I think there used to be, it was more interesting and more, let's say, provocative uh, historically than it is now. Because I think that, and I think it has a lot to do with that there's so much going on simultaneously in the world number one, and number two is a lot of prediction is more or less part of the majority of people's lives now. It's not like, whereas I think historically you could do some predictions and everybody would be fascinated by this. I think now a lot of people are just like, you know, every day you can pick up a, a, a magazine or go to a blog and people are expressing about innovation and ideas and futurisms and there is so much, you know, it's a lot of information. So, um, yeah. Anyway, whether there's a market for trend forecasting or not, I don't know whether I, I don't really, uh, I, I think that trend in general, and I said this yesterday, I think that you know, when I was in university, if we used the word trend, we'd be thrown out of school. You know, so this idea of trending, everybody's like chasing something. It's, it's, it's a sad part about it is it, it, it makes life a little bit too superficial. You know, when you think of things that are relatively permanent or semi-permanent, for example, you're making a building, I don't know if you want a building to like be, you know, part of the trending of the moment of the language that's going on at this moment. First of all, furniture, it's, it has, you either get a design patent on it, which then only lasts you 14 years anyway, 
and even with design patents, it's, it's kind of nebulous of how much protection you really, really have. And the other one is copyright, right? So copyright like a form of art, a form of, but because a chair has function, that's when it blurs and it's, a, it's problematic, I think. And design in general is problematic in the sense of copyright because on one hand it's a piece of art, but it's not a piece of art, it's a, it's a functioning object. So, and I, I in university, uh, the universities I taught at, I taught patent law and many of these things I know very, very well. And uh, it's very, very, very hard to win and protect yourself globally in, in design. So uh, my, my feeling of the copy part is, is that in general, it's going to happen regardless. So I think that uh, if something you do is copied, it's the old adage that it's flattery. It means that you did something that someone feels there's a market for it or a bigger market than let's say the market you're doing. You know, the best thing you can do when you're, you're being copied is to go talk to people who are copying and make an agreement with them. That's the easiest thing to do. Not to fight them, but to, to marry it. So that about like years ago, there's a great story actually that was in China that Honda, there were um, you know, 50cc scooters, motorcycles, small motorcycles being produced in Chinese and they copied Honda down to the T, the same bike. And they actually, even the word, they didn't write Honda, but they wrote some variation of it on it. So Honda tried and tried and tried to stop it and, and have cease assist and all this stuff. And they finally went there, met with the Honda people, made an agreement, changed a few things to match their quality, and made an agreement with them and sold them as Honda bikes. So recently I went through a very similar thing with a chair I had done for, uh, for a company in Denmark and it was knocked off in China and uh, so I told them the best thing you should do is go to the factory in China who's copying the chair, make an agreement with them that they produce for you because prior to that the company was only producing in Denmark so of course the chair was much more expensive. They went there, met with them, the quality is excellent, made an agreement with them, now the chair is owned by that Danish company, right? So that's the way you do it. So if you, you know, if you can't beat them, join them. I say design fault is that there's a lot, just a lot of our physical world is not functioning well enough. So it's not a singular problem. It's for that every designer and everything we put out in the world to be a little thoughtful that we are soft, volatile human beings, fragile human beings. So to put really like sharp corners on tables and all these things around us, I think we should just, you know, be, be considerate, let's say, of, of the human dimension and, uh, and to try to do better around it. You know? It's amazing, like I, 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 every other day, and we all go through this, when we like hit ourselves, smack ourselves on some corner or some piece of front, some leg, something. And just that annoying moment, and that annoying moment that I have, because I'm a designer too, I just, it reinforces this idea that this stuff just shouldn't exist anymore. And because we produce so much, we should solve all these problems. Those things should be a given that they're all taken care of and they're all solved. And we can walk around this world and just have less annoyances, let's say, you know, less, less problems. Um, that's, I mean, that's one thing. I think the second thing we need to resolve in a way is, is that the production of goods, that everything we do really has to be cyclic. Everything, every material, every product we do has to be either biodegradable, perfectly cyclic, or, or it shouldn't really go into the marketplace either. And I think we, we as designers have a responsibility. What I do with a lot of my clients is I tell them or show them the right material to use or, or try to get them uh, interested and motivated into doing product that, uh, that uh, can be recycled, et cetera, et cetera. Um, at the end of the day, you know, the problem is when you work with the large manufacturers, they govern the, the, that, that position, you know. But it's always worth the discussion to see what the interests are and you know, if there's an opportunity to make change that way. If you're working on a small level, I mean, that should be, you know, you can, you can be in control of all that.